All right, our next guest is an absolute hero of mine. His name is Dave Rubin. Dave has taken a very interesting path in life where he was, like many of us at a certain point in time, just a drone in service of the machine when it comes to a lefty. And then, like Saul on the road to Damascus, the scales fall off. And then here we are, a free-thinking man whose YouTube uh, channel is through the roof, whose Rumble channel is even bigger, whose Locals page is one that he owns. And of course, you can find all of his stuff at The Rubin Report. I'm very pleased and very excited to say the great Dave Rubin joins us from the other side of the world. Welcome to Sky News and g'day from Australia, mate. Paul, it's good to be with you. I gotta say, man, I, I've heard a lot of intros in my day and uh, that's a top 10 right there. That, well, I feel like that kind of, it kind of encompassed everything. You, you hit on a little bit of everything. I appreciate that, man. Thank you. Happy to help. Now, by the way, congratulations. Uh, you're, uh, you're now a father for the, the, the second time. There is nothing harder than two kids and certainly two kids of basically the same age. I think about five months difference right now. How are you going with the juggle? Yeah, I got a nine week old and a five day old downstairs. <laughs> Crazy, two months to the day. And uh, let's just say it's been a lot of pooping and crying and screaming. And now there's a kid involved, so it's a lot. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> now, also, uh, you know, on, on your show just the past couple of days, uh, you went out of your way to explain that at one point in time, uh, your son's, uh, your new son's name is Luke, and that would have been something to do with Star Wars. But because Mark Hamill is a nutter, you've had to come up with a different <laughs> reason for why you called your kid ah. Luke. Please explain to Australia why you called your kid Luke. Oh, I'm very excited about this question. Uh, so look, Star Wars went off the rails, obviously, with these last three movies that were horrible. I could talk all day, actually, about how the prequels over time are gonna look better and better, and I think actually explain a lot of our political madness of the day, but we'll put that aside for just a moment. But for years, I thought I would have a kid named Luke because of the original Star Wars. Then the trilogy, the new trilogy is terrible. Mark Hamill, as you said, I mean, he became just sort of a leftist lunatic. I'm pretty sure he called me racist on Twitter once. Uh, and then I thought, okay, if I'm naming this kid Luke, I gotta come up with another Luke. There's gotta be another Luke. Now, of course, there's Luke from the New Testament, but I needed something a little more culturally in line with me. And uh, as you may remember in the final episode, it was a two-part episode of The Golden Girls. Uh, <laughs> B. Arthur, Dorothy's Bornack, marries Blanche's uncle Lucas, played by Leslie Nielsen, one of the greatest <laughs> comic actors of all time. And uh, that, his name was Lucas. We're gonna just say that he's named after uncle Lucas from The Golden Girls. See, that's very good. And I agree with your logic, but uh, you know, Frank would have been okay as too after Frank Drebin. Frank Drebin would have been fine. I'm a big Frankie Valley fan. I like Frank Sinatra. Frank, Frank, Frank E was actually on the list. Number three. Get ready for number three. All right. No, 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 no. I'm retiring, man. This is it. <laughs> yeah. All right. Now, let, let, let's talk a little bit about your journey. Um, and again, like all people of a certain age, and, and there's two years difference between the two of us, although obviously you look 20 years younger than I do. Um, the <laughs> no, it's true. The, the point is that Understandably, we're surrounded by people who end up being of a certain politics. If you start to get anywhere near the media or, you know, the front end of the plane, it's fairly obvious that there's a there's a well-trodden path to go on. But certainly I know for me that, you know, 20 years ago, uh, even as a young person in university, I could start to see the garbage that I just was repeating. And because I enjoyed mm -hmm. being a free thinker and ironically, because I enjoy being uh, cynical and I enjoy being sceptical and I, it means eventually in the same way that once you start to sort of poke holes at things like, uh, you know, faith, then you can also sort of start to poke holes in the new faith that is wokeism. What was the moment when you thought, you know what, um, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to swim against the tide here? One of the reasons that I love Australians, actually, having toured with Jordan Peterson and we did sold out shows all over the country, and then I was going to bring my first book, Don't Burn This Book, to Australia for a tour in 2020, which got canceled because of COVID, is that the spirit of the Australians and the political incorrectness and the, and the fun uh, of Australians reminded me of Americans more than any other people, more than, I would say, people from the UK, more than, more than Canada. Um, there was really, I, I felt a camaraderie there and an understanding of similar issues. So for guys like us that are, you know, right in that middle 
you know, mid 40s, it's right in the center of the Gen X thing. When we were in school and when we were growing up, we had solved most of the problem. We really had. We didn't fully realize it, I suppose, but I think that mo no one was, it wasn't allowed, it wasn't okay to be a racist, it wasn't okay to be a bigot. Even on gay issues, it wasn't cool to hate gay people anymore. We had moved all through that for the people that grew up in the 80s and into the 90s and to the early 2000s. Then this, this very twisted, evil, woke cult, you know, seemingly came out of nowhere about seven years ago, although I think actually it was leading for a long time throughout, you know, they, they say the long march through the institutions. So it was happening at the collegiate level really for decades. And you gotta give the Marxists credit. They got into these systems and they destroyed these systems. So we may say, okay, all your ideas are bad. You're, you're a bunch of buffoons and you're socialists and blah, blah, blah. But you know, give the devil his due, look what they accomplished. So it's, it's not just as easy to dismiss them like that. As far as my wake up, there, there were a couple moments, the most famous one, which now I think has been seen probably about 50 million times on YouTube, is when I had Larry Elder on. Larry Elder is a, a black conservative, really a libertarian, but this is about five years ago and I was still a lefty. We got into it about systemic racism and he just basically beat me senseless with facts. And instead of doing what most lefties do, which is call him you know, a horrible name or cancel the show or kick him out or whatever, uh, we aired it. We aired it as is. And a few days later, I saw a lot of people in the comments going, you know, Dave kind of listened. And I did kind of listen. And from there, I started talking to other people, say Dennis Prager, Glenn Beck, Ben Shapiro, the list goes on and on. And I started finding that, although I had some disagreements with some of these people on the right, and I still do, by the way, that they were very open to discussing them. They knew what they thought and why they thought it. And I found them, honestly, this was the most shocking part. I found them nicer. That really was the, the real shocking part because you know there's this meme that somehow on the left, the left must love tolerance, which so the implication is that the people on the right are bigots and angry and, and it just simply is not true. Since I have gone through this metamorphosis, transition, whatever you wanna call it, and now I hang out with all these scary right-wingers, they are happier, they are more generous of spirit, uh, they smile more, they laugh more, and most importantly, they're willing to agree to disagree. So you can sit at a table, and I've done it, with, with 10 great thinkers. And they don't agree on everything, of course, and we can argue it out. I'm talking sitting at a table with Peterson and Douglas Murray and uh, you know Ben Shapiro and all these guys, and we can do it over some, I like tequila, they usually like whiskey, we can do it. And guess what, we can disagree on a million things, including the nature of reality, and then we're still good to go at the end of the day. And that's very different, unfortunately, than what has happened on the left. People will automatically say they want to be a fly on the wall. No bugger that. I want to be at the table with a cigar. I can't wait to, uh, to, to see versions of this conversation pop up all over the shop. I mean, also what's, you know, what I'm, I'm trying to work out is I think that in many ways, wokeness took hold because of the the ultimate flaw in the Death Star of what had been built that sadly was starting to blow up, you know, around our awakenings, is that the very openness of the people that you just spoke about, the willingness to say, hey, come be part of the conversation, meant that people took advantage of that and they took advantage of it at every possible level. And then they ended up with the ones who were able to, you know, essentially uh, become the, the, the roommate who eventually kicks you out of the house. That was a very sad realization for me to come to actually. It was hard for me to accept what you just laid out there, but I have accepted it. Uh, I've written about it. I, 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 think, it's, I think it's true that, that unfortunately, if you were to look at your idea set as a hierarchy, right? You cannot put tolerance as the most high grand point because if you do that, you will become tolerant of intolerance. Obviously, this is the paradox of tolerance. And liberals, unfortunately, liberals who fought for equality and fought to get black people to vote and for women to vote and fought for gay rights, all just causes of equality. Unfortunately, when we got to the place, and from an American perspective, let's say the last great one to fight was perhaps gay marriage. That was the last sort of real bastion of inequality in America. And once we got that around 2000, I think it was around 2015 at a federal level, um, they needed to leave well enough alone. 
But this is where their endless desire for tolerance caused the wokesters to come in. By no stretch am I a traditional conservative. I mean, no way whatsoever. However, I, I do believe that I am now conservative in my ideology and that I'm trying to, in some ways I'm trying to conserve liberalism, but I would say in a broader sense, I'm trying to conserve the ideas of Western civilization that your country and my country and many other great nations are founded upon. Yeah, look, if you had a look at my voting record, it would be no different than the most staunch uh, of, of social conservatives. But there's certainly plenty of things that I'll disagree with with uh, with many of those people. But you end up being in fellowship with uh, a certain group of people that, I, again, I say are free thinkers or traditionalists or all of those things, because the, the new left is so radical, so aggressive. And in a recent conversation that you had with uh, comedian Bill Maher, who, again, you know, I vehemently disagree on most things, but I like his style. Style, uh, like your good self. You talked about how, how you know, late night shows like Stephen Colbert's, like the much of the, and I hate the term mainstream media because by inference that means that somehow we're off in a fringe, which I think is a problem to sort of pretend that how we're off in some... corporate press? How about corporate press? There you go, right? And you talk about everything is in service of the machine, right? And the more that you, you know, the way, the way that I put it is that everything's about kissing the ring and the more lovingly you can kiss it and the more meaningful you can kiss it, then the further you go up, uh, up the ladder. Um, but how do we resist this? How do, how do we in our personal lives and then as a movement start to get some wins here? Because it's wonderful that we can all be pissed off about this every day, but I'd like to turn pissed off into some wins, please. So, you know, that, that moment where I mentioned this thing about how Colbert is in service of the machine and Marr really, it really hit him. He was like, yes, that is, it was almost as if he was looking for the words himself on that one. And I was very happy about that because Marr, to his credit, is not in service of the machine. You may disagree with Bill Marr on everything. Somebody watching this may say Bill Marr is wrong on absolutely everything. He has Trump derangement syndrome. And blah. But... Bill Maher often fights with his own audience. Bill Maher's audience now, he said to me in that same interview, same chat, that he thinks his audience is 30% conservative now. You can't be in service of the machine if you're really talking to all sorts of different people. It's why I'm very proud of my audience because I, if I was to sell out, let's say, or try to be in service of my audience, I wouldn't even know which way to go at this point because my audience, I hope, is following my lead and I'm not following their lead because then you really end up as nothing. That's what Colbert has become. So when you see these guys, Colbert, I would say John Stewart, unfortunately, because he could have been much oh, better than he's man. become. Uh, yeah, a bunch of these other guys, Jimmy Kimmel, they're just giving the machine what it wants. Oh, the machine's for vaccines, I'm for vaccines. The machine's for mandates, I'm for mandates. The machine wants to blow up Russia, I'm for blowing up Russia. Bill takes counterpoints that make it much stronger. But, but to specifically answer your question, which was about what does someone do to not be in service of the machine, Look, I truly believe that, uh, you know, if you, if you were to look at this, let's say, from a biblical perspective or a historical perspective, I, I believe that, that David beat Goliath. I believe that story is such an innately human story that the little guy can beat the big guy against all odds. Nothing is too big to fail, actually. Uh, it, you know, in an economic <laughs> sense, things, things don't fail because we keep giving them money. But everything, Rome fell. Everything can fall. So I believe that if you, if you fight for something earnestly and honestly and you, and you learn more and stay strong and make good friends along the way that you can be on this adventure with, you know, it's like you can do anything. And I think that that's, I think my life is an example of that. And I, I just fundamentally believe it as a human being. It's a good point. The first battle is the battle within. Once you can win that one, then you can start to, uh, you know, unite with fellow, uh, with fellow free thinkers, and then eventually there's more of us that have the courage to uh, to take on such a small ranty few. Look, I've taken up way too much of your time already. I hope it's the start of a couple of conversations we can have. But just before we go, um, Joe Biden. This is a bloke who, of course, can, in my view, defy gravity because the only human being I've ever seen fall up the stairs. Um, it seems fairly obvious um, what should happen at the midterm elections, that there'll be a handbrake put on him. It seems fairly obvious that as a result of his policy set, he should be uh, swept in 24. But let's talk about the elephant in the room here. We all love uh, the bull in the china shop that is Trump. But I've got to say, I'm probably thinking that Ron DeSantis might be a, a better person at being able to achieve many of the things Trump wants to set out. But what's your sense about Biden again, 
with the machine being able to pretend that anyone other than the machine is somehow uh, a virus about his real chances in 2024 versus what we hope his chances are in 24. Yeah, this is another one of those give the devil his due kind of thing, which is that Biden may be incompetent. He may have surrounded himself with ridiculous people like Kamala Harris. They may have hired all of these people because of diversity rather than skill, but these people are still here. They're still here and don't think that they're gonna give the, key, the keys to the kingdom away that easily. I said the day that Joe Biden was uh, sworn in as president that I did not think he was gonna make it the four years. It was very obvious the entire time during the campaign that the cognitive stuff was becoming a bigger and bigger problem. And now it's just an abject disaster, which when you talk about the mainstream media or the corporate press, they're still ignoring it. They're still ignoring it right now. And that's also one of the reason that, reasons that so many people are, are crazy about politics, because we can all see something. We can see something very obvious and the media won't touch it. So our reality does not match up with, the media is supposed to be a mirror to our reality. And that, that disconnect, I think, is causing problems. By any estimation, the Republicans certainly will get the House. They should get the Senate. There's a bunch of close races. You know, I don't have to bore Australians with the minutia of everyone, but there's very, very close one in Arizona, very close one with Dr. Oz in Pennsylvania, close one in Ohio. I think the Republicans will probably get the Senate. We shall see. Uh, and then the real question is, of course, what happens in 24? You can already see what the media here is doing, which is that they're really afraid of DeSantis. Of course, they Ooh. hate Trump and they're afraid of Trump. But now what they're trying to do with DeSantis is DeSantis is Trump, but he's worse because he's competent. No. As, you know, so the idea is right. Trump was Hitler, but, you know, sort of uh, like incompetent Hitler, buffoonish Hitler. You know, Leslie Nielsen, Frank Drebin, Hitler, where now we've got Hitler with an accountant, and that's a problem. So, look, I, I've gotten to know the governor a little bit. I live in Florida, obviously. It's the freest, greatest state. Let me, let me tell you one other thing about Florida that people don't know. So, you know, we had this horrific hurricane, Hurricane Ian, uh, you know, a week or 10 days ago. Uh, it was basically a Category 5 destroyed. I mean, it's, it's catastrophic damage of Southwest Florida, one of my favorite places on Earth. It has been rebuilt so fast. In, in 10 days, they have built bridges already to some of the barrier islands there. They got electricity back in, in 24 hours almost everywhere. Everyone is chipping in here. They had 50,000 electric linemen out in the field working virtually the next day. This guy is running the state the way anyone on earth would want their country to be run. So they are going, if you think what they did to Trump was bad, Wait till they pull out the stuff with this guy, but he's good, he's decent. And by the way, Paul, he's a, he's a young fella like you. He's 44 years old. <laughs> well, I'm, de I'm never gonna call you the old man, but uh, you can lead the way as the big brother. <laughs> Let it, let's do it that way. Dave Rubin, what a thrill to talk to you. Um, look, again, if our paths cross, it would be, uh, be amazing. But thank you so much for spending a little time with us now and can't wait for you to come and join us on the set in Australia one day.